It's the Raymond Sims Show on the Coliseum Sports Network. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Raymond Sims Show here on the Coliseum Sports Network and streaming live at Spreaker.com. I'm Raymond Sims of course and I'm glad that you can join me on a beautiful Wednesday wherever you may be. Rather you are on the East Coast and it's 11 o'clock or you're out on the West Coast you're just getting your day started at 8 o'clock or you're here in the Central Time Zone with me and the Coliseum Headquarters and it is 10 not necessarily on the dot, but uh, just glad that you're here all the same. You can interact with me on this show by accessing the chat function at Spreaker.com if you're watching this live. If you're catching this on demand, you can leave a comment on my YouTube page at the Coliseum Sports Network. That's YouTube.com slash user slash Coliseum Sports Net. You can also get up with me on social media. I'm popular with that stuff and all the other stuff that the kids do there's a uh, twitter which is at sims coliseum you can like the sims coliseum facebook page and if you're into tumblr you can catch me at sims coliseum.tumblr.com i had reblogged a picture of it was a gif set actually i don't know if you if you pronounce it gif or gif but i go with gif uh it was a gif set of different Boston Bruins players heading into the locker room. I don't know if it was at an intermission or the end of a game. And they were just like giving dap to this little little guy who was sitting next to the who was sitting next to their path to the tunnel. And they all gave him dap and they all, you know, pat him on the head and stuff. It was it was adorable, man. You can ke- check out that type of adorable stuff that I happened to reblog over on Tumblr. But today, got a pack show, got a lot to talk about. College football, the college football playoff rankings just came out today. Uh, we also, I also get into some NBA action from last night. There were different games with different levels of significance. Won't cover them all, but I will. I do have a few that I do want to discuss. And also some comments said by a player that is from here. And by here, I mean Chicago. And I'll come... I'll talk about those as well and the NBA being in Mexico tonight. And also I'll talk a little baseball, check in on what's happening during their off season, during their winter time. Uh, I guess you could call it snowball or you couldn't. Maybe maybe you can't because it's kind of lame, but I'll call it that if you don't. Snowball will check in on some winter MLB action, including some awards being doled out as of late, a big contract being signed and maybe a turning point for a certain MLB team and their future. But first, college football, because football, that's really the actual reason. No, no particular one. Just it's football. The college football playoff rankings came out for the third time yesterday night. Of course, they have that, that playoff show that they do on ESPN. I have yet to watch it. I haven't watched it at all. I usually am doing other stuff and I remember, oh wait, those rankings came out and I checked them out either later that night or in the morning like I did today. But uh, a cut, a little shake up at the top, which is the only part that truly, really, really matters. But existentially, what does matter in this world? But the top four is really what people are, are looking at. Who's who's in? That, that's what it is. It's a much more truncated version of bracketology. And after some big losses by teams like Notre Dame and Auburn, uh, there's uh, there's a new some new faces at the top of the of the poll. And they are as follows: number one, Mississippi State; number two, Oregon; number three, Florida State; and number four, TCU. Now, if you're following along at home and you happen to have your college football standings handy, you may notice that Mississippi State has zero losses, Oregon has one loss, Florida State has zero losses, and TCU has one loss. So you may notice that pattern and you're probably thinking, wait a second, how is Florida State number three, but they don't have a loss? 
and there are angry people on Twitter that are asking the same question. They're usually, they're pretty much concentrated to a particular region of the Florida panhandle and perhaps southeastern and uh, Georgia or southwestern Georgia and southern, extreme southern Alabama. Probably asking the same question there too and are, are none too pleased. Probably not, you know, probably more angry than you are as you are hypothetically casually asking this question. And it's very interesting the type of of thought process that the committee, this 12-person committee, has been putting into these rankings. Now, I have to say, I am pleased with a couple of things about this committee. Usually, uh, you know, committees that decide things like the tournament, there's always going to be somebody that's upset. But at the end of the day, uh, when you think about it and you get their reasoning from them, yeah, you, you're pretty much fine with it and that's how I'm feeling right now I think that a lot of thought is going into these rankings all from one all the way down to 25 uh, there are a lot of people on the outside that are wondering why would they even put out 25 when they really only need four good question but they're going with with the 25 full but they're putting a lot of thought into it and they're using a lot of different variables because no one case is the same as all the other cases and i like that and i also like that they're being particularly transparent about it i when i read these because like i said i haven't watched an episode an actual an episode like his actual show and that it's kind of the ncaa's point in doing that was to make it that way like a tv show i have seen a lot of quotes from jeff long every time that this that the rankings have been released explaining why they have decided to put out the or put out the rankings the way that they did and I like that I like the transparency that the committee is trying to put forth they are put they're going into the room whatever day they do it I don't remember how long they deliberate about this stuff but they go into the room they look at the body of work and strength of schedule and who you beat and who you didn't and then they put out the rankings and then when Reese Davis or whoever does that show or reporters ask them, hey, why did you put this team here? Why did you put this team here? Jeff Long comes out and says, this is why we put them here. And I think that is great in terms of transparency, especially in an organization such as the NCAA that does not have a lot of that. And it, it quells a lot of the, the conspiracies and the, well, not all of them, but a fair amount of them and a lot of the complaints that you would find if this committee just put out the rankings and just moved on with their lives. Like, it, you'll say, why is this, for instance, why is Florida State undefeated but number three and Oregon has one loss and is number two? Well, Jeff Long went out and said it and people are like, oh, okay. Like, I haven't seen a lot of outrage from columnists during my show prep uh, leading up to this. And even with the TCU Alabama decision, a lot of people have wondered why it is the way it is. Well, they came out and said that TCU has really passed, mostly that TCU has mostly passed the eye test and in the teams that they have faced, they've beat them more soundly than an Alabama team that while their wins have been impressive and particularly winning at Death Valley, just against the the amazing crowd that they have down there in Baton Rouge, it was still a close win compared to TCU's constant shellackings i mean they beat up on k-state who's also who also is in the rankings 41 to 20 so you get that reasoning and even if you disagree with it and if you made these rankings you would have put alabama number four because they beat lsu you at least you know why the committee did it instead of them not saying anything at all and i find that impressive the transparency and the thought that goes into this you do wonder some of the people who have the jobs in the committee it's like aren't you supposed to be running a running a thing somewhere because i know there's a couple of athletic directors in there but at the same time people in high positions your president like of the country and then of like universities and ad's and stuff they have time to do this stuff and deliberate other things to without compromising their job so just keep that in mind if you want to you know complain about people in positions doing other stuff other than the stuff that they're put in to do now if they're lazy about it then hey go crazy but in a lot of cases this doesn't take too much time out of their schedule especially something like college football the impact games this week are particularly important there's a few 
I read an article by Brad Edwards. He highlighted some of them, but there's two really that I am looking at. That is Mississippi State and Alabama. I mean, it's an SEC game. It's going to be really good anyways, but the fact that it's number one and number five, and it's really jostling for position, for uh, playoff positioning, like it's probably... This game is probably determining which SEC team is going to end up in the uh, college football playoff. That's just, they're just so much on the line on top of the fact that it's already an SEC rivalry. That's a game I'm really looking forward to seeing. And then the other impact game I want to see, maybe you, you probably haven't thought about it, but I know a lot of people may be as well, Florida State and Miami. That that one intrigues me more than the Mississippi State Alabama because we already know how that one's going to go. It's going to be a close game. Florida State and Miami could go a number of ways. Florida State could be very dominant and win soundly at Miami, a program that is not what it used to be, but is on its way up slowly. But at the same time, Miami has a equally impressive quarterback in Brad Kaya, and he's a freshman, and they have a very presentable defense. They are top. Uh, 15 in certain categories they're top 10 in yards allowed so it could turn out to be a very tough game for florida state and miami could pull the off the upset and play spoiler which will be important for them because i know they want to rebuild their program but that's just a look at some of the college football playoff ratings just like that i'm going to switch over to basketball such as uh kobe missing all of the shots and being on top of the world for it. And then also some other old guys playing basketball in California as well. It's the Raymond Sims Show on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network. Raymond Sims show on the Coliseum Sports Network. Streaming live at Spreaker.com and it'll be on demand both at the Coliseum Sports Network on YouTube as well as on Spreaker. So if you missed anything, including my college football segment that I opened up with at the top of the show, don't worry. It'll be here for you and you can check it out anytime that you want. But right now we're moving into basketball and we're going to be on basketball for a while. So I hope you like basketball. There were only there were six games on the schedule. I say only because, of course, there are nights when there's 12 or 13 games. But uh, there were still some pretty interesting games. I mean, they're all very special in their own way. But I'm only going to talk about three particularly today. And then I'm going to talk about one that's happening tonight. So uh, I'm trying to, you know, cut down cut the I don't forget the I forget the term something about wheat and chaff and whatnot. Uh, but the first game I'm going to talk about here is the Los Angeles Lakers and the Memphis Grizzlies. The Lakers are on the road and they are kicking off a six game and nine night stretch. 
So that'll be fun for a team that is that is devoid of a lot of talent and is led by a high strung but a very talented player. That's that's just going to be a bundle of joy to deal with uh, for the Lakers. Hopefully they don't implode on the on their way along the way. But they start things off in Memphis and they fall to the Grizzlies 107 to 102. The Grizzlies are now 3 and 0 at home and they are currently on a 17 game regular season home winning streak. So very impressive for them. The Lakers fall to 1 and 6, but on the bright side for the Lakers, at least they didn't make Charles Barkley starve. So there's an upside to that. Now this wasn't just a blowout. It wasn't a, a Globetrotters Washington Generals sort of deal. Uh, the Lakers were able to fight back a couple of times, including a, a huge comeback in the a huge comeback attempt in the fourth quarter for the Lakers. But uh, in the end, uh, the Grizzlies were just able to come out on top. The nail in the coffin was really a Zach Randolph put back off of a Mark Gasol miss, and that's really what what put things away for uh, Memphis. Now, the big story out of the Lakers and Grizzlies game, besides the fact that the Grizzlies just keep being awesome and the Lakers continue to not be, is Kobe missing a shot in the fourth quarter, which moved him into the all the all-time position for most missed field goals or, or most missed shots ever. And he uh, passed John Havlicek for that mark. So he is number one when it comes to missing shots. Kobe is the best out there. But another award that or another uh, milestone that I'm surprised has not been mentioned as much is that Kobe surpassed Michael Jordan in all time field goal attempts. So uh, Kobe with missed shots uh, with he is the all time leader in missed shots and he passes Michael Jordan uh, on a list of all of all time just field goal attempts, period, not just misses, but just field goal attempts. So I'm surprised that one wasn't highlighted more. But on the night, Kobe went 10 of 26 from the field, but still came out with 28 points. That is something, that's a that's a Kobe Bryant line that I have expected for at least the past 10 years. So, you know, 10 of 26 night, but getting still getting 28 points. Not surprising to me at all. My uh, cousin and I we used to joke, probably about in the late 2000s, I think was when we really used to joke about this, was the fact that... Uh, Kobe just has an uncanny ability to have awful uh, shooting nights percentage wise, but at the same time, still being able to pick up just a bushel of points. Like I used to just throw out weird stat lines, like he'd go three for 56 and still end up with like 45 points. And I would just wonder like, how, how is that a thing? But Kobe just figures out, figures out a way to do it. And last night was not an exception. And I mean, they needed Kobe because he was part of the reason that they were able to get a fourth quarter rally going before the door was pretty much shut on them. But 28 points out of Kobe Bryant, six assists. Another joke that we used to have about Kobe was the fact that whenever he would share the ball is when the team would actually lose. So in this case, he has six assists as a shooting guard. Not not a good look. And we, we would just shake our heads and we say, Kobe, Kobe got to stop sharing the ball. Like he he just he has to tape the ball to his hands. He has to get some stick him. He has to have negative assists, and, and the Lakers would win. But uh, we don't we we don't haven't had to joke about that much lately because over the, the past couple of years, Kobe's dealt with injuries, so he hasn't played in a lot of games. But maybe we'll bring the jokes back because he's doing the exact type of things that we used to joke about. Uh, Twenty eight point six assists, seven rebounds, four steals type of night that you would expect from Kobe Bryant. It's a very good one, of course, but his team just really can't help him out there. Carlos Boozer had 20 points, you know, the same type of stat stuff and he did here in Chicago. Jordan Hill, though, I, I applaud his effort out there, 13 points and 14 rebounds. On the other hand, for the Memphis Grizzlies, like I said, they just continue to be awesome. It's really uh, amazing this type of start that they have gotten out to as a team they as i said before they are now seven and one so the grizzlies are definitely a force to be reckoned with in the west but we already knew that at least last year they had a low playoff spot but just for the fact that they were a, such a defensively sound team 
you knew that if you were facing them, it would not be an easy series. And they, when people talk about how tough the West is, the Grizzlies are the epitome of how tough the Western Conference can be. They are kind of the representatives, even though a lot of people don't talk about them. And that's the that's the, the other thing about the Grizzlies is that like the Spurs, they they're just not often discussed uh, when it comes to tough Western Conference teams that while I feel they are the epitome of a tough Western Conference team, they are the stock character of a powerful Western Conference team. They are also uh, a stock character for the small market team that does not get a lot of publicity. So this team with Zach Randolph and Mark Gasol leading the, the front court and Mike Conley running the point and Tony Allen being one of the best defensive stoppers in basketball. And yet they just don't get that type of coverage. And when they do get the coverage, it doesn't bring in the ratings. Uh, it's it's unfortunate, but we've seen the Spurs go through it for over a decade. So they'll, they'll live. They'll be fine. They just have to keep winning the way that they are now. Mike Conley was the one that led the way for Memphis. Conley had 23 points. It's very interesting, my relationship with Michael Conley. No, not relationship as in I know him. I never, I don't know the man. I probably haven't been in the same state as him uh, many times in my life, with the exceptions of the games that he played in, the Big Ten games he played in college when he would come to Illinois or when he goes to play the Bulls for the Grizzlies. Otherwise, never seen the man in my life. He, knows, he looks like somebody I knew from high school. But otherwise, no. Mike Conley and I do not know each other. When I say relationship, I'm referring to just when I watch him on TV and how I feel, which is annoyance, usually. I, I don't know. For, all the, for the few games that come on TV that feature the Grizzlies, whenever I happen to watch, and whenever it is games of high stakes, such as games against the Thunder or the Spurs during the playoffs, for instance, Conley always does something stupid, to be quite frank. Or in my opinion, he does. Or maybe just in that instance, he doesn't work around the screen right or he doesn't close out correctly or he takes an ill-advised shot. And I'm like, Mike Conley, how are you still in the league? What are you doing? When in reality, Mike Conley has been a huge focal point for the Grizzlies' success over the however many years that they've had success. It's been a while. The The Grizzlies used to be a... a, a a laughing stock. That was the word I was looking for. They were laughing stock in the Vancouver days and in the beginning of their Memphis days, but uh, eventually they have become the the most consistent team in terms of playoff appearances. But Mike Conley has been an important part of that, especially at the point guard position. Uh, I guess, and I'm thinking in my head here, he's probably one of the best uh, point guards in the Grizzlies franchise history, the very short franchise history. Because, I mean, they've had Jason Williams. They've had uh, Mike Bibby. But Mike Conley has meant a lot more in this certain time in history. And in this case, he had 23 on this night. So this was one of those nights where I, the the frustration that I usually feel when I watch Mike Conley on the court is slowly starting to erode. And I think that if he keeps having performances like this, he doesn't have to have 23. He doesn't have to, you know, lead the team in scoring. He just has to be a competent point guard whenever I watch a Grizzlies game, whenever I feel like that happens to be. If he just keeps doing that, if he just continues to be consistent, then I won't hate Mike Conley anymore. But this, this was the first step. And I think it's a first step in just a very long road to recovery be of my dislike of Michael Conley. Uh, one other prime performer is one that you wouldn't be surprised about, really. You'd be surprised by his stat line, but you wouldn't be surprised by him. Mark Gasol, there were some highlights of him during the game. He was out there looking good. He threw one of those West unsealed outlet passes uh, at one point in the game, and I think there was another time where he hit like a pass between his legs, and he got it to somebody for an easy layup. Might have been Conley, for all I know. Uh, but Marc Gasol was out there just looking good in terms of just fundamentals. But if you look at his stat line, you'd be surprised just how few points he got in the minutes he played. If I said that he had eight points 
Marcus Gasol had eight points. You think, wait, was he hurt? Did he hurt himself? Is he injured? Should I check my fantasy team? No, no, he's okay. He went three for 10 from the field, bless his heart, in 32 minutes. But he, that to recover from that, he still had eight rebounds, three of them offensive boards, and then he had nine assists. That was really his bread and butter tonight. So it was kind of like the table's turn in ter- if you want to think about it in, in that sort of way. The table's kind of turned in that one and five, that one position and five position relationship. So in the case of Mike Conley, he was the leading scorer that was being aggressive and attacking the basket, while Mark Gasol was the one that was kind of staying back and dishing out the ball when it was necessary and getting and opening up good shots for players because Marcus Saul got nine points. He finished with eight points, eight rebounds, nine assists, all very short of a trip, all just short of a triple double, which reminds me of something that I'm covering on odds and ends at the end of the show. So stay tuned for that. But Marcus Saul, even though all of his stuff was in single digits except his field goal attempts, you still got to applaud what he does and how important he is to the Memphis Grizzlies. And I tell you, the Grizzlies lucked out on that Gasol for Gasol trade because they could have looked very, very stupid. After the break, I look at another group of old guys and how they performed on the road on a back-to-back. It's the Raymond Sims Show on the Coliseum Sports Network and Spreaker.com. Raymond Sim Show on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network. Just got done talking about the Lakers and the Grizzlies. Kobe missing all the shots for history sake and passing up MJ in, an, in another category. And then just just the, the goodness that is the Memphis Grizzlies and their 7-1 and one record, including 17 straight at home. But now I want to move on to another old man passing a milestone. Uh, this uh, this particular episode, I guess, is very octogenaric today. But uh, the Kings falling to Dallas on the road, 106 to 98. They were up by as much as 24, but that lead slowly eroded thanks to performances from Dirk Nowitzki, from Monte Ellis, and from Chandler Parsons, who was coming off of two uh, rough games from the field. And they were able to help the Mavericks come back, take the lead, and never look back. So the Mavericks get the win 106-98, and both the Kings and Mavericks are now 5-3. and three. Uh, The reason I bring up this game is because Dirk Nowitzki, uh, in the fourth quarter, off of a shot on the elbow, 
on the left elbow, moved past Hakeem Olajuwon as the NBA's ninth all-time leading scorer, and also moved past Hakeem Olajuwon for the all-time international scoring leader. So of all the players for, that were not born in the United States that have played in the NBA, Dirk Nowitzki is king among, among them in terms of scoring. And then uh, to get back to that ninth all-time score uh, position that Dirk has uh, on that NBA list, the next person up for him is Elvin Hayes, the former Rocket Elvin Hayes. So a uh, historic night there for Dirk Nowitzki, and congratulations to him. Uh, also a very great win for him to do this particular milestone on. Um, it's also interesting in contrast to Kobe, who was able to get the records that he got, and which were a little a little more dubious in terms of the miss one, at least. But the a field goal attempt, just how many shots he had taken over his career, that one was good. But the fact that he did it in a loss compared to Dirk Nowitzki, who was able to help his team rally during the middle of the game, because uh, the, the rally took place from the middle of the second quarter to about the end of the third. The fact that he was, that his historic accomplishment aided in the victory of the Mavericks. Just an interesting parallel. Like, I'm not uh, I'm not suggesting anything. I think it's still good what Kobe did, but just an interesting parallel that Dirk did his thing and won. Kobe did his thing and unfortunately lost, even though he helped his team stay in it. Now, uh, I want to cover a couple of things. First, I'll get to the Kings because my last thing probably might run me up against the break if I talk about it too long, maybe. Oh, one note, though, before I get into that subject, you gotta love how I do that in layers, but don't worry, I never forget how far I go down the rabbit hole. The Mavs, with this victory, they're now 5-3, and three. they're 3-1 three and one at home, they are, uh, they were on a 21-win home streak, at least that's what I have in my notes that I picked up from the AP report, but... They're uh, three and one at home this season. Perhaps that was a home streak against the Kings. Maybe that's what it is. I think maybe that's what it is now that I think about it. Because they already got their loss, so that home streak is broken. But I think the Mavs are on a 21 win home streak against the Kings. I think dating back to 2004, I believe. Don't quote me on that. But the Kings, they end up getting the loss. They blow a lead. Uh, they had a lot of turnovers forced upon them 20 to be exact and including seven from Rudy Gay and five from DeMarcus Cousins so two of the most important players accounted for over half of the team's turnovers a 60 percent to be exact just a rough night I uh, talked about DeMarcus Cousins yesterday or the day before and I pl plotted his poise and the fact that he really does seem like a more mature guy and I was worried however about how losses, how rough losses, or how the Kings possibly losing a lot more, you know, as they would re possibly regress to the mean, how that will affect Cousins' maturity. Now, uh, I know he's a competitive person, so I'm not saying that if he's upset about a loss or he's sad about a loss, that that just means that he's immature. I think that means he's competitive, and that's good, and you want that, especially out of a guy as big as him that's as important to your team. Uh, both in, in literal stature and just in terms of production. But I'm worried about if they continue losing, is he going to start sulking into old habits? Or does he have the right support system around him? I mean, there's some old, there's some young players and there's some veterans on the team. Are they going to uh, be able to rally him if he does falter? Because nobody's perfect. Are they going to be able to rally him so that he doesn't uh, backslide into some of his old habits? Uh, DeMarcus Cousins, one of his support members, Rudy Gay, who was also on the team with him at the World Cup. So maybe uh, just something to consider. I think maybe put it on the back burner in your mind if you're thinking about it, because you never you never know. And I think it's something to consider, especially when you get a rough loss like this, where you have a big lead and then you just blow it. I mean, it happens in basketball. I don't think that's necessarily an indictment on the Kings and how they played this year. You just have losses like this, and you got to learn from them and move on. Now, I do want to say this. Like I said the other day, I played a game of 2K with the Kings, and 
Uh, I got some big performances, namely from Rudy Gay, and DeMarcus Cousins was very helpful, and it was really a team effort, but there was one guy that ticked me off, and that was Jason Thompson. He he picked up no points. I think he went like 0 for, 0 for 4 or 0 for 3 or something like that. That's what he did in Dallas. He was 0 for 3, got 0 points, had a plus minus of negative 14, so in real life, he is apparently just as bad, but Jason Thompson only played 13 minutes in this case, as opposed to I had him playing his regular starters minutes in my 2K game. So that just shows you video games, man, they are really uh, being close to the life, apparently. That's kind of uh, funny there. But to move back to the Mavericks and more specifically to Dirk and his accomplishments, just a, a really great accomplishment for a really great guy who's very loyal to a team that has helped him develop from his, his crazy blonde buzz cut days with the royal blue and green of the old Mavericks jerseys that I sort of kind of miss in those reunion arena days all the way to today where he is the all-time leading scorer for all international NBA players that have ever played. Just really a really great evolution with a lot of accomplishments along the way and you just got to appreciate it. You also have to wonder his place in terms of international players. And I, I wonder what you guys think about that. You can tell me about it at Sims Coliseum on Twitter, or you can chat with me, leave a comment on the show page. But uh, how, how do you, where do you put Dirk in terms of all time great international players? Uh, the only two that I am framing for this particular discussion, but you can feel free to bring in any. I mean, there's Steve Nash from Canada, um, but Dirk and Hakeem, just in t because Dirk surpassed Hakeem and they are now one and two in all time scoring, it's very interesting to think about just how good Dirk has been over the course of his career and the fact that he is still very good over the course of his career. I mean, so far this season, which is his 17th, he's averaging almost 21 points a game still, and he had 23 in last night's victory. So he has not tailed off in terms of production. He has, of course, he, he didn't play as much when he was young. I don't think I knew about the existence of Dirk Nowitzki until like 2003, 2004, once the Mavericks started making the playoffs. But he started to make the... Uh, he started to make the climb, maybe a little sooner, like 2002, I think I started hearing him. He made the climb, and he's been consistently effective and efficient ever since. And like I said, it doesn't seem like it's going to tail off, uh, assuming health, for Dirk Nowitzki. And you just wonder just how great that makes him, that he could probably play another one or two seasons. And I'm being conservative with that, because I want to say he could possibly play longer before he really just starts uh, losing his effectiveness and that's something considering that even with u.s players just any player in the nba there are guys that have all that already if they were to play their 17th year they just wouldn't have anything in them i just talked about mike bibby earlier during the Gri grizzly discussion and where mike conley stands for the grizzlies in their franchise history you look at mike bibby and how long he was in the league how he was one of the premier point guards in the league even though the teams he played for weren't always the most competitive and then you know you think about how bad his production tailed off to the point where people were like, oh my God, this guy is awful. Get him out of here. Dirk is in his 17th season, and he is still about as productive and important to his team as anybody. Dirk Nowitzki is in a position where if he is out, that will greatly affect the playoff chances of the Dallas Mavericks. And you can't say that really about a lot of teams in the NBA and a lot of players that have been around as long as he has. I mean, Kobe, you could say that, but the team around him isn't playoff worthy. So that affects the type of, uh, type of usefulness that Kobe has, even in his extended tenure in the NBA as well. But I think that that's uh, particularly important, and especially because uh, we saw what happened to Hakeem Olajuwon, that he had his effectiveness over the course of his career, but even his production tailed off, particularly in his final season when he played for the Raptors. You, you don't think much about his time with the Raptors because, he, I mean, he wasn't he wasn't that, that cornerstone that he was with Houston over the course of his entire career. Uh, I will say this, though, and you got to give credit to uh, 
Hakeem for this one. You know, besides the dream shake, which has completely reinvented the post game for a lot of players uh, today. But at the same time, Hakeem, in my opinion, is probably the only player that can say that he himself as a star led a team to the finals to a championship solely by himself and i only bring that up because for a while before lebron started winning his championships a lot of the complaints was the fact that he couldn't lead the team to a championship by himself even though he led a uh, a Cleveland Cavaliers team in 2007 to a championship. They just got swept by the Spurs because they're the Spurs. I mean, come on. But Hakeem, and just looking back, if you think about all the champions, everybody had at least two stars on their team and then some role players. Hakeem's team is really the only team, the Rockets that won two championships in the mid-90s is what I'm referring to, has really been the only group of teams since, I'll say, uh, Bird and Mag uh, Magic and Bird's rookie year to have just gone there solely on one star and a bunch of role players. Those role players were very good, but you can't sit there and say that there was an actual second score. Like you can name Vernon Maxwell and Kenny Smith and Robert Ory and, Mar and Mario Ellie, and, un and you understand how important they were to those championship teams, and especially Clyde Drexler when he came in for the second one, but they weren't really... Well, Drexler was a star, I'll give you that, but the production was just wasn't as strong from 2 all the way back to 12. And Hakeem was really that only constant. That's really the only time that that has happened, and I think that helps Hakeem's case as one of the best players, one of the best international players of all time. But Dirk, at this point, as the all-time international scoring leader, definitely has a case for all-time great. Uh, from in terms of overseas players that he can make for himself. So congratulations to Dirk on his accomplishment. Uh, when I come back, I'm going to talk Spurs and Warriors before we get to the top of the hour. It's the Raymond Sims Show on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network. Nearing the end of hour number one here on the Coliseum Sports Network and Speaker.com, the Raymond Sims Show, just moving on along. Started off with college football, but we have uh, moved into basketball, pro basketball now. To talk, uh, college basketball is right around the corner. Uh, my college basketball preview show, um, which I'm working on and just studying up for, I'm ready to go. That'll be on Friday right here on Spreaker.com and on demand at Spreaker and the Coliseum Sports Network YouTube page. 
So uh, be on the lookout for that. Been a good show so far. Had some technical difficulties yesterday where the connection went out twice and I'm utterly petrified. I did some stuff to kind of fix the problem and hopefully that is working out. Let's just say it dealt with uh, over stressing the line that is used uh, here at the Coliseum headquarters in terms of just the, the cable and internet that we that we use here. So hopefully this helps the, what the things that I did and we won't have any of those problems anymore. We'll see. But talked about the Lakers and the Grizzlies. Kobe becoming the all-time leader in missed shots and passing MJ for all-time field goal attempts. We talked about Dirk and him leading, helping to lead the Mavericks from a come-from-behind victory against the Sacramento Kings and also passing Hakeem Olajuwon for the all-time leader in international NBA player scoring and ninth all-time now in all-time NBA scoring with Elvin Hayes next on his list. But now we'll move into another group of old guys. Like I said, very octogenaric today in terms of my discussion topics, for the NBA at least, with the Spurs defeating the Warriors 113-100. to So this game, not as close as the last two that I discussed, but this game isn't any less important. For one, just a highly anticipated game. You got the Spurs and you got the Warriors, just two very... Uh, very powerful teams in the Western Conference. The Warriors started off very hot, start off 5-1 and one coming into this game. The Spurs, of course, are the defending champs and are the favorite to repeat as champions. And last night, you saw why. Um, they went out there and they played, they, they went out there, they started their starters for the second game of a back-to-back. -back. They were in Los Angeles on Monday night. And they went out there and they they won. They played near perfect basketball. They looked fantastic out there. They uh, shot four, almost 50% from the field. They shot 40% from three, 40% on the button. They forced uh, t 19 turnovers to eight of their own. So it was just really a great night all around for the San Antonio Spurs. It both in terms of efficiency and production. Oh, not to mention that they also uh, beat out the Warriors in terms of bench production, namely from Manu's 17 points and Corey Joseph's 11, but they still beat out the bench production from the Warriors. So just a, just a good night uh, for, the, uh, for the San Antonio Spurs and kind of the reason that they are, you saw the reason that they are the defending champions. And that they are favored to win again. It also tells you something about the fact that they, on back-to-back -back nights, they're probably the toughest back-to-back -back in the Western Conference for the Spurs. I mean, uh, a tough back-to-back -back in the Western Conference would include the Spurs usually. But since they can't play themselves in an official game, the Warriors and Clippers is a close second. It tells you something about the Spurs standing in the West and I like to go back to a phrase from everybody's favorite show, The Wire. And that is, come at the king, you best not miss. That's essentially what you learn from this back-to-back -back that the Spurs played. They played the Clippers on Monday and beat them 89-85. And then they come out here against the Warriors on the back end of a back-to-back -back and beat the team by even more. And it's really just, uh, it's an indictment, I think. I mean, it's early in the season, but I think it's an indictment of where these teams are right now. That, no, the Spurs are still number one, and they'll still handle you when they have all their guys out there. You know, we, we may complain about the fact that Greg Popovich rests his guys, and so with some of these national TV games that those rest days happen to fall on, we get upset. But at the end of the day, we see that it pays off when it's time for the Spurs to actually uh, lace up the shoes and play ball. So the Spurs are still king of the hill. They were able to expose flaws in both the Clippers, even though there have been a number of teams that have done that so far this season. And I know it has frustrated head coach Doc Rivers. And then they also showed flaws in the Warriors' uh, uh, style of play. Not in, just including turnovers because they already were leading the league in turnovers. Not much of a difference here. They also kept Steph Curry from hitting a three. And you would think that it would snow in Nogales, Arizona before he would miss a, he would miss a game 
without hitting a three, but it breaks a 75 game streak, I think was the number 75 uh, of a game where Steph Curry hit at least one three pointer. The record holder is Kyle Korver, who ended his streak last year at 127. So, well, now Steph Curry's just going to have to uh, start up a whole new one. Steph Curry, NBA highlight all star. I'll, I'll say that much. But the, the Spurs out there still getting it done. It was also very cool for a uh, former Spur, Steve Kerr who won two championships under the the coaching tutelage of Greg Popovich. To It was kind of like a teacher meeting the student sort of deal, except in this case, the teacher is still out there schooling the student in addition to pretty much schooling everybody else. But still uh, very cool. It, even though it was a 13-point loss for the Warriors, Steve Kerr took it pretty well for a guy that got uh, soundly beaten. It was kind of a... It wasn't surprising, but I think that considering it's the beginning of the season, that Steve Kerr was taking on his old men, his co his old mentor, even though he was a veteran at that point, still a mentor. Uh, Steve Kerr could probably take take this one a little easier than say if the Spurs and Warriors meet in the playoffs and they end up losing, because by that point the Warriors will have played the Spurs enough to know some of the idiosyncrasies about the team that they could probably expose. So losing then and then losing in the playoffs would probably be something that uh, that Steve Kerr wouldn't like. But that's the thing, is that the Spurs established themselves still atop the Western Conference by beating up on the the other favorites to win the Western Conference Championship, the Clippers and the and the. Spurs. Uh, the Warriors, and I almost failed to mention that, that both of those games could very well be Western Conference previews, um, that the Spurs are still atop of the West, but the Warriors and Clippers both have a chance to look at the game film from both of these games, see what they did wrong, see if they can expose anything uh, about the Spurs, and of course every team is going to look for something. They'll find something. But, of course, from our untrained eyes, it's probably a lot harder. But they can apply this to also future games. Rather, uh, the Warriors and Spurs play three or four times. I'm not sure. The Warriors could very well still uh, learn from this and be able to beat out the Spurs next time. And if they face off against each other in the Western Conference Finals, then... The Warriors can look back at this game, get over this honeymoon period of of, men, of coach and mentor, and they can go out there and play a more competitive brand of basketball. And hopefully by that point, they'll have gotten over their turnovers, hopefully. But uh, you never know. One other thing I want to cover here, just to put a bow on the three games that I covered, is that uh, the Grizzlies have a off have awful homer announcers not in terms of technical ability i think that the the analysts on the grizzlies telecast are just fine but i really have a problem with their homerism as i do with the spurs both the grizzlies and spurs are very good competitive teams in the western conference and their announcers are just downright insufferable the warriors aren't so bad but they tend to whine about the refs a lot, and that can get pretty annoying. I'm already tired of that. And Bob Fitzgerald, who used to do the voiceover for the NBA 2K game, he's the Warriors announcer. I like him as an announcer. I just wish that he would stop whining about the refs all the time. I just wanted to get that out of the way before the end of the next hour. But I will be talking a little more basketball, covering a few notes, and then I'll start moving into baseball. Got Still got a lot more to cover in the next hour of the Raymond Sims Show on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network.
It's the Raymond Sims Show on the Coliseum Sports Network. Welcome back. Hour number two here on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network. Glad that you could join me. Uh, Just got done talking about particular games from last night as well as a little college football at the beginning. A lot to look forward to, especially in the world of college football. There's two games in particular I'm looking forward to, so I'll try to make an effort to watch them live, particularly the Mississippi Alabama, Mississippi State Alabama game, and then the Florida State uh, Miami game. Those should be good ones. Hope they don't disappoint me. But in this particular hour, I'm going to finish up a little more basketball talking, then I'm going to move into some baseball before I get to odds and ends at the end of the show. Still a couple more NBA notes that I just want to get out of the way, certain topics in particular, and one of them involves somebody from Chicago. Uh, I know yesterday I made my my statement that while, you know, I don't want to make this a completely Chicago-centric show, but I'm in Chicago, so I might as well talk about stuff that's happening here, just so y'all know. Like, you you think you know, but you have no idea, so, uh, you know, give you the perspective from Uh, inside of the bubble but one thing that came out nationwide was Derrick Rose's comments that was made yesterday I'm assuming it was yesterday uh, discussing why he takes certain uh, games off and of course a lot of people were thinking especially the fact that he had hurt both of his ankles recently he sprained them both in the game against Cleveland on Halloween and a lot of people figure that he was taking off games kind of to to rest that the rest of those ankles and you know make sure that he was okay and good to go in March and April and that could be true but that's not what he said instead he said uh and I wish I could give you the audio but I'm not sure how that works as far as uh, copyright and whatnot but he basically said that he is looking towards the future but like way, way past the future, like past the immediate future. So when he's 50 years old, he wants to be able to be able-bodied enough to attend meetings and attend his son's graduations and things of that nature. And he didn't mention anything about resting up for the playoffs and to make sure that he's okay. And that's left a lot of people upset. The fact that he is choosing to that he says that he is choosing to take games off because he is looking towards his post-playing career. Because a lot of people would think that he would be resting such that he would be ready to make a championship run, which is something that, for instance, the San Antonio Spurs are doing. So there's a lot of, of anger about his comments, but you're not going to get it from me. Actually, you're going to get the anger from the people who are angry at him because I think it's really stupid that people are mad at Derrick Rose, even if he said something straight from his mouth, especially something to that effect. Uh, first off, are we all just going to forget that he, he had that he's been out for two years? Like, are we just going to forget about that? I know he's gotten both of his uh, his ACLs surgically repaired, but yeah, I mean, you never know. You saw what happened. With, with Grant Hill and how his t- career was very long, but he was not the same guy that he was. Um, and you see how he plays out there, that every time he falls, you get nervous. So we're just going to ignore all of that. We're just going to be mad. We're just going to say, no, he has to play. He has to play all the time. He has to play always. Forget forget the future. He has to play all the time, just always. Like we just completely forgot that he totally hurt himself and was out for two years. And we were all afraid that he would you know, not be the same person that he was. And that went now that he's back and every time he attacks the basket and he crashes on the floor that people hold their breath. Or maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm the only Bulls fan out there that still gets very nervous whenever he steps on the court because I'm hoping that he does not hurt something again. So the fact that he is looking towards his future, a man that has missed two years of his basketball life recovering from unfortunate injuries is a little skittish just a little bit about his health in terms of what's happening with his legs the fact that he's just a teensy bit skittish about that and trying to preserve himself such that he is able to walk around without worrying about you know not being able to walk with it and use his legs I'm okay with that and I am fine with him saying that it's okay to think about the future and want the best for yourself I kind of get tired 
of like people trying to shove the team concept down people's throats, even though the only person that's going to be there at the end of the day is you yourself, your own body. Sometimes you got to think about what is best for you. Now, also, the fact that he is thinking about himself seems to not have an effect on his play or his team, because that's really been the argument that I have heard. And this morning in particular, when I've actually heard reactions to this, um, it's come in the form of football players who have complained that him thinking about himself is going to affect the chemistry in the locker room and is going to have players questioning Derrick Rose's uh, ability and his commitment to the Chicago Bulls winning a championship at least in 2015. And I think that that is bunk. Keep that in mind that the Chicago Bulls are not the Chicago Bears. And I know, why would I drink, drag the Bears into this? Well, because they have a player that is thinking into the future and is affecting his, and it is affecting his play on the field. And that guy is Lance Briggs. So it's understandable that using the frame of reference that when somebody is thinking too far ahead into the future, that it affects their play on the field and it leaves people questioning their abilities to help the team win on a consistent basis. Derrick Rose is not Lance Briggs. The Bulls are not the Bears. Every time Derrick Rose has taken plenty of breaks, he's taken the games he sat out, and apparently it has been because he's thinking about meetings and graduations. He's taken those, those breaks. Those have happened. But when he has stepped out on the court in 2014, 2015, he is the best player out there on the court at any given time. And it's not like he's falling back, you know, shooting jump shots, settling for mid-range pull-ups. No, he's attacking the basket. He's going in there. He's being aggressive. He goes in there and he gets that shot and he, he's out there screaming and he's showing energy, the type of energy that you would expect from a leader of your team. His, just because he is sitting out certain games, which another team has done and it has been proven to work in the San Antonio Spurs, does not mean that his commitment to a championship has changed. That just because he said he was thinking about graduations and meetings does not th mean that he is not thinking about April and May and June because this team is equipped to go to June and they are designed to play in June. And I'm sure that Derrick Rose every day is thinking about that as well as thinking about his future and wanting to be as able-bodied as he possibly can after a rough career of being a scoring guard, which by extension, you know, leaves a lot, puts a lot of mileage on your body. So there's no, there's no lack of commitment there. And most importantly, there's go not going to be any effect in the locker room. Because while Derek is making the decisions, Coach Thibodeau is allowing it to happen. Thibodeau, who was, is notorious, at least over the past couple of years, for playing his players for an extensive amount of minutes. I mean, Jimmy Butler is still playing 60 minutes a game when there's only 48 in the NBA game. So that's still happening, even though he's kind of toned it down now that he has a deeper lineup. But he's pat he's fine with it. He's committed to it. Joe Kim Noah has been playing with Derrick Rose for years and you don't see him questioning the ability. And this locker room is probably, probably as strong as it has ever been. You don't hear much about disconcert coming out of the Bulls locker room. You don't hear about that. You don't hear, ooh, trouble in the Bears locker room. You've heard about it in the Bears locker room, but you haven't heard about it in the Bulls locker room. You haven't heard about it for years. Heck, I don't even think I've heard anything about it during the Vinny Del Negro years, but uh, I mean, that's neither here nor there. The locker room is fine with this. Derek is still playing at a high level anytime he does play. And he's just because he said he's thinking about his future, who isn't? Who out here isn't thinking about their future? If you aren't, you're not going to get very far. That, and just because he said he's thinking about his future does not mean that he's not thinking about winning a championship. If you're on a team such as the 2015 Chicago Bulls, how could you not be thinking about a championship and going in there and playing your hardest every day? There's nothing wrong with self-preservation, especially when it's already being practiced in mass in the NBA by a dynasty. One man practicing self-preservation, practicing a practice that is being done by a dynasty. I don't see anything wrong with that. And people like to throw the money into it. The fact that, oh, if you're being, if you're being play, paid a bunch of money, you need to go out there and play whenever you can. Like, sawed off. Just sawed off. That, that just reeks of butt hurt to me. That's how that sounds. Whenever somebody talks about 
you have the money, so you have to do this in most cases. That just reeks of butthurt to me. There's certain times where, for instance, if you are out there playing all the time and you stink and you have shown potential that to play better, then yes, you are wasting your owner's money. But when you are going out, when you are preserving yourself, possibly for the future, but also for the championship to be able to make your team competitive. And then when you do play, when you do actually go out there, you're dominating. You're not wasting your owner's money. Like Jerry Reinsdorf wants another ring. And if it's going to take Derrick Rose resting himself in regular season games against, who, who, which games did he miss? He missed, I think he missed the Philadelphia game. He missed, the first one he missed uh, was Orlando. Was that it? He's only missed a couple of games, but he's still been very dominant in the ones that he has. So I'm sure that Jerry Reinsdorf and Tom Thibodeau are fine with this. As the season goes on and the games get more important, I might understand your side if he starts sitting out more important games that may affect playoff positioning, for instance. But right now, this is just a made-up controversy because usually the Bulls don't have anything to talk about. Usually when you talk Bulls, you're not talking about anything really. Yeah, they're a really good team. Nothing to talk about. But otherwise, I think people are just making too much of this. Just, just get over it because it, it's fine and it's innocuous and it's worthless. The other NBA notes I wanted to talk about was that tonight the Rockets and the Wolves will be playing on ESPN. Start time is set for 9 o'clock. But there's something, there's a wrinkle about it that I like. That is the fact that they are playing in Mexico. I thought, I think that's really cool. They weren't able to play last season. The Spurs and the Wolves were the matchup last season, but something happened with Mexico City Arena that they had to move the, that they had to cancel that game and the game had to be replayed in Minneapolis. This year, hopefully everything is good with the new Mexico City Arena because it's big and it's gorgeous and new age. So I I hope that they get to play in Mexico, uh, Mexico City. I probably won't be able to see it live, but I will be able to catch it so I can talk about it tomorrow. And then also my last thing is discussing LeBron's triple-double being taken away. Uh, After the fact, the statisticians, they always go over the game to make sure the stats are accurate. And they happen to take away a rebound and an assist. So he only ended up with nine assists, leaving him without a triple-double. I just thought that was uh, incredibly hilarious. But that's my look at basketball for the day. Coming up next, talking about basketball or talking about baseball, uh, awards were awarded and a team might be on a turning point with a manager in a stadium. It's the Raymond Sim show on the Coliseum Sports Network and Spreaker.com.
Raymond Sims Show here on the Coliseum Sports Network. Finished out my NBA talk in the last segment by uh, getting in my feelings about Derrick Rose and the comments that he had about his future and him resting uh, during the regular season. Uh, If you want to hear about those comments, if you happen to miss them, worry not. You can catch this on demand both on Spreaker and at the Coliseum Sports Network YouTube page, which is youtube.com slash user slash Coliseum Sportsnet. So don't worry, you haven't uh, missed a thing. You missed a lot, but you haven't missed a thing. I was very worried that the volume... Uh, Of course, you hear my volume now. This is the standard volume I've usually been talking in, especially for most of the show. But it got a little higher. It got up there, kind of notched it up about a couple of of decibels there. So uh, hopefully your eardrums are all intact and everybody is okay. I will continue to talk at this particular volume for the remainder of the show, which is uh, about 45, a little under 45 minutes here. Uh, Moving into baseball, awards are being handed out. It is award season. In the hot stoveness of baseball, I don't know. I had a lot of like I, I'm I'm rustling around in my head for some reason different things that I can call the winter baseball off season. Don't know. A snowball came into mind. I know it's lame, but I actually kind of like it. Kind of like how I like Fallout Boy. Kind of lame, but I like it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to come up with different names. If you have any suggestions, let me know. At me on Twitter, at Sims Coliseum. Tell me on Facebook. Or, I don't know, hit my uh, ask box on Tumblr if you so insist. But I need, I need, I don't know. I don't want to just call this the off season. That doesn't seem like enough for something like the baseball off season. Currently, the uh, Major League Baseball has two things going on. The Japan Series, which I'll talk about a little later. And... Also, the GM's meetings are happening right now, and the owners' meetings are next uh, are next month at some point. I don't remember the exact date, but right now the GM's meetings. I'm sure that a lot of people are making some big deals, making deals uh, between general managers at whatever they usually do at these meetings. One deal that was made before the I think it was before the GM meeting started, which was on the 10th was Michael Kadire going to the New York Mets. And he says it's not about the money. I don't know how much money he got anyways, but he signed a two-year deal with the New York Mets. And there's a number of reasons, including uh, playing on a contending team. Yeah, sure. Uh, His relationship with David Wright being based on the East Coast. Uh, It's a two-year, $21 million deal. I had to double-check here. But Michael Kadire is now a Met after a couple of years with the Colorado Rockies, where he had some very good production. Now, last season, he probably would want to wanted to have played a lot more games. He only played 49, had to deal with some injury there, unfortunately. But in those 49 games, he batted 332. So he was a monster in 2014, batted 331 in 2013 for the Colorado Rockies. So the bat has definitely been there for him, uh, at least lately. Like, he didn't start hitting uh, over 300 until last season. So it's really his production's really picked up. His uh, Even though he's always been a valuable player, he spent most of his career in Minnesota. He's been with Colorado the last three years. But now they're adding a big, big bat in New York. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how he turns out out in New York, both uh, in his outfielding position and then also in terms of production, because we saw Curtis Granderson be a a huge get for the Mets last season, but his production kind of tailed off there. David Wright, who's usually the model of consistency in baseball, he sort of tailed off last year. So it'll be interesting to see how somebody who has been batting about 330 for the past two years is going to... Uh, work out in New York at City Field. Uh, but also the MLB awards have been being doled out as of late. They've slowly been coming out. The Rookies of the Year, they came out, I think, was it at the end of last week or was it at the, at the beginning of this week? It was very recent. Uh, Jacob deGrom of the Mets, speaking of them, getting the NL Rookie of the Year award. And then Jose Abreu of my White Sox getting the AL Rookie of the Year. He kind of, he pretty much ran away with it. I mean, there's some candidates that could have been considered. I'm sure 
I'm sure there were some people to think about, but no. Jose Dariel Abreu was the a unanimous pick for AL Rookie of the Year, especially being one of the top leaders in the American League or in all of baseball and home runs. He's just had an amazing season, and hopefully there's many more to come for my sake, <laughs> mainly, just being a little uh, a little selfish there. So the, uh, the, But the fact that Jacob deGrom, you know, Jose Abreu, one of the top leaders in baseball and home runs, but on the team, on the less popular team in, the, in a big market, and then you got Jacob deGrom, who plays for the Mets in a big market, but isn't really well known. It was a discussion that was brought up on Keith Olbermann's show on ESPN about how the casual person probably does not know who a lot of these players are, especially compared to back in the olden days, because Keith Olbermann, even though he, you know, he's been around a while, he has white hair, still surprised me how old he is, but he's been around a while, but he was making the point that back in the day, even with less technology, a lot of people very well knew the different players on different teams in the league. But it seems that baseball has almost purposely made itself more regionalized to the point that even a lot of these outstanding players that uh, that have been coming through the league and that have put on some great performances. Sure, guys like me, that have, especially guys like me that have gotten into baseball more, but like regular baseball fans, they may know who it is, but in terms of reaching out to the more casual fan or just trying to get more and more people into the game, these guys are, are pretty much anonymous, it, it, it seems, especially somebody like Jacob deGrom. Like, you'd have to look up his numbers to see how great he is. It's not like people, if you say Jacob deGrom, people will, the average sports fan will go, oh, yeah, oh, he was dominant. He was a great rookie. Of course he won the award. No, I think deGrom is probably one of the, the least known rookies despite his production. Uh, other guys like Corey Kluber and Matt Shoemaker were up for... You know, a bid could have made a case, especially Corey Kluber. He was great this season. But I think, you know, Jose Abreu probably did a lot. He did a lot more in terms of production, individual production, to kind of win the AL award for uh, the Chicago White Sox and for the American League. Another, uh, another set of awards that were ha handed out were League Manager of the Year awards. In the National League, it was Matt Williams of the Washington Nationals. And for the uh, American League, it was uh, Buck Showalter of the Baltimore Orioles. So it was a a Beltway affair. Um, you know, a lot of people, were they were saying Beltway a lot during, when the Nationals and the Orioles were in the postseason, though Washington is the one with the Beltway. Baltimore has a Beltway too. Okay, so yeah, Beltway, that's a good name. Glad I had that talk. I figured that out. Uh, Matt Williams in his first year, is it his first year or his second year? But very early on, very early on in his managerial career, goes out there, leads the Washington Nationals to a great season. They run away with the NL East without any problem, and he gets rewarded for it, and rightfully so. Uh, at the same time, Buck Showalter from the American League, back in the saddle yet again, this time with the Baltimore Orioles, leads them to their first playoff appearance in a while I don't remember the exact year but they brought it out I think it was 97 was the last time so back in the Ripken days so it's been a while for them and show Walter leading the way one interesting thing I noticed when the managerial award awards were announced was the fact that Buck Showalter has been winning manager manager of the year title on the fours for a while now he won it in 94 with the Yankees I'm gonna say Yes, it was 94 with the Yankees. That was the first time. Then he won in 04 with the Texas Rangers. And now he wins in 2014 with the Baltimore Orioles. So I don't know. Like, you know, I just really got into baseball. And I know about players and managers now in the here and now. My baseball history, and there's a whole lot of it, a little more fuzzy. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Buck Showalter could probably be in the discussion for one of the greatest managers of all time. Uh, if you want to jump down my throat and suggest that there are a bajillion other managers much better than Buck Showalter, talk, let me know on Twitter. 
because I I really do like you no know, sarcasm want to be educated on this whole thing. But Buck Showalter to win three different Manager of the Year awards with three different teams over the course of 20 years. That's got to say something for the type of manager that he is. And I mean, I like him and I thought he was a great analyst when he was at ESPN. I know people have their different feelings about, you know, analysts just in general and, and play by play announcers. But I thought he was one of the good ones. So uh, my my congrats to him and hopefully he can continue to do well with the Orioles for however much longer he'll be there um, they still I don't know who's on the market for them but it's going to be uh, it should probably be some pretty good years on deck if Buck Showalter continues to manage the way that he does I will say this though since I have a little more time here before I go to break but as you know, I actually discussed, I was discussing this last week about the Chicago Cubs and the fact that they have made some pretty crucial moves. Uh, more specifically, of course, they uh, signed Joe Madden as their manager. Joe Madden just decided, hey, I'll opt out and see who wants me. The Cubs wanted them. The Cubs got them, got him. So he is now the manager of the Cubs. You have a minor league system with prospects that are starting to come up. And some of them, just a couple of them, are starting to produce right off the bat you have them definitely in the free agent market they can make they got enough money to make some huge acquisitions they're considering russell martin as one of those guys to kind of shore up the catcher position and pretty much effectively displace wellington castillo so hey great for the cubs great for chicago sports fans and all of that but in all of that, I just want to take this last little bit to say, what about the White Sox? Sure, they have the rookie of the year in Jose Abreu, but what else are they doing? Like, I have yet to hear anything about the White Sox making any, you know, huge moves. And Jerry Reinsdorf apparently cares more, from what I hear, he cares more about his baseball team than his basketball team, which I find hard to believe because his basketball team has been more successful, at least since I've been alive, than his baseball team has. But... Hey, these are journalists who have been around him much longer than I have. So sure, I'll take it. But I haven't heard anything about the White Sox making any moves. I'm going to need them to get something going, man. Because I, I don't want to spend a year with the White Sox in the cellar again. And the Cubs are on the north side having all the confetti and, and winning all the games and putting up that flag every time they win a game. Make some moves, White Sox. Yeesh. Not done with the uh, baseball. But after the break, uh, the Rays making some moves, and it makes me happy. It's the Raymond Sims Show on the Coliseum Sports Network and Spreaker.com. In a minute. Got a break. Here we go.
Raymond Sim Show here on the Coliseum Sports Network. Uh, just was checking on my Twitter timeline at Sims Coliseum. Uh, there's a there's a rapper out there named Troy Av. Oh, he is he's an interesting character. He is. I'm gonna talk about him. Also, the Japan series. I figured out what that was, so I know what that is now. Gonna be talking about that over in odds and ends in a little bit. But right now, just a little more baseball to talk about. Uh, the Tampa Bay Rays are in the midst of transition. Very important transition. So they lose their manager, of course, Joe Madden. He just decided to opt out and explore his options. And apparently his options were go to an up-and-coming team in the Chicago Cubs. And he was like, okay, yeah, let's do that. Let's uh, let's sign me up for that. Yeah, let's do that. Also, So they're without a manager now. Their manager that helped them uh, turn around from a laughing stock is the Tampa Bay Devil Rays to a perennial contender for the AL East title in uh, the Tampa Bay Rays. As a matter of fact, last season, their 77-85 and record was their worst season as the Tampa Bay Rays, and even in their 77 and 85 season, they weren't really out of it until like a month out or like a halfway through the final month of the season. So that really tells you something about how competitive they were on a regular basis. Also, they play in a dome, like a straight up dome. Every other team in baseball, including o- Oakland and their god awful stadium, play either outdoors or in a retractable roof stadium so that, you know, you can either enjoy the beauty that is summer weather regardless of where it is in the country or you can close the dome when it decides to get mean and rainy or if it gets cold during the later months or the early months. But no, Tampa went full dome and of course they they did that back, this predates the Rays uh, back to 1991. 1990, I believe, is when it, the the dome was built that they play in, which is now known as Tropicana Field. So a lot of people like to say that it is the worst stadium in baseball. I see your Tampa Bay. I raise you the aforementioned Oakland. Like it's really bad. Like the sewer backs up. Like there's still dead rats in there. Yeah, Oakland. Oakland's leading is the clubhouse leader in really bad stadiums and stadiums that need to be bulldozed immediately. But Tampa's down there because the atmosphere is is drab. It's hard to get there for Tampa residents who have to traverse, who mostly have to traverse causeways to get to different parts of the city because just going around the peninsula that St. Petersburg is on is very difficult and very time consuming. So very hard to get there uh, for some people. It's in a rough neighborhood, but it's like get over yourself with that one. But it is a dreary atmosphere, even if they try to spruce it up, even though the Rays have done their best to spruce things up. So two different things happening on that front for the Tampa Bay Rays. And there's hope in both aspects for uh, for the Tampa Bay Rays in that instance. And that makes me happy as a fellow Ray. Can't say I'm a Tampa Bay Rays fan, even though I liked Joe Madden. I like the color scheme that they have uh, and the fact that they are the Rays now. So, you know, I think that's awesome. Couldn't really get into their brand of baseball. But while I still have MLB.TV, I guess I could go ahead and look back at some games. Maybe I could get into them. But whatever game or however they are, they were then under the Madden Rays, uh, they're probably going to be different. And who's going to be at the helm? Who's going to be in their Captain Morgan pose on the steps of the dugout? Uh, Well, it'll be one of 10 people, apparently. There's a lot of guys on the list, on the preliminary list of managers that will possibly be replacing uh, Joe Madden down in Tampa Bay. And I will read them all to you because I have that kind of time with the lack of commercials. Two ESPN personalities were added on Tuesday in Barry Hall of Fame shortstop Barry Larkin and Doug Glanville, both of ESPN. But there was already a list of eight candidates that was listed last Thursday. So bench coach Dave Martinez, who's already there, Raul Ibanez, who just recently retired and but was still hanging in there as a player, uh, Washington and Cleveland manager Manny Acta, who's also at ESPN, 
uh, Milwaukee Special Assistant Craig Council, well known for his crazy batting stance, one of my favorite ones ever. Uh, minor league manager Charlie Montoyo, I, I don't have anything on him. Giants bench coach Ron Wotus, uh, what up Wotus? Uh, former Seattle manager Don Wakamatsu. I don't remember. I don't think he did particularly well record-wise, but I don't know what that, how that translated to his actual abilities to manage. An Indians coach, Kevin Cash. Those are your 10 guys. Kevin Cash, Don Wakamatsu, Ron Wotus, Ch Charlie Montoyo, Craig Council, Manny Acta, Raul Ibanez, Dave Martinez, Barry Larkin, and Doug Glanville. Those are the 10 guys that the Tampa Bay Rays are considering for replacing Joe Madden as manager of the Tampa Bay Rays. I can tell you, got, tell you absolutely nothing about their managing ability. I don't know. I have no clue whatsoever. Especially even after talking about Matt Williams and Buck Showalter in the last segment. I, I got nothing. I think it's a great list. There's big names on there. There's small names on there that have pedigree. Uh, sure. Good list. I'm sure that there's a baseball purist out there who knows all these guys back and forth and is like, this is a horrible list. Why didn't they go for this guy? I'm, you're not going to get that from me today in this 13-minute space. Um, I, I don't know. But I think it is an interesting list. And whoever they pick, hopefully they know what they're doing. Because while I don't know how they are beforehand, uh, it can make a whole world of difference if they get hired and they don't know what they're doing. Kirk Gibson just got fired as manager for Arizona and I'm happy about that. I like that. I think he, you know, is as great of a player as he was and I will never forget his his big home run in the World Series in the late 80s, 88, I believe. If that's wrong, let me know. But in 88, uh I'll never forget it, but he was a jerk of a manager and he was awful and there might uh, possibly been some very weird xenophobic undertones in the way that he, he carried himself and wanted his team to carry itself in the roster makeup, but uh, he's gone now, so don't have to worry about that. I was very tired of him talking about playing the game the right way, and yet his team was not playing the right way, as in actually winning games. But you could end up like with a Kirk Gibson, or you could end up with a Bruce Bochy, who has been leading the Giants consistently to contending for the title in what is already the random game that is baseball, but he's been able to go out there and lead his team to three different World Series titles, or you don't even have to shoot that high for the moon. You could just have a manager that has a consistently good team every year, like Mike Sosha, and that, that could work too. So with these 10 people that have been uh, announced, uh, you can, it's really a crapshoot in my opinion, as is a lot of things in baseball. I mean, when you build a sport on the fact of swinging a small stick at a very small ball, it, it can get really up in the air. But I just hope that the, that it works out for Tampa because they're the Rays and I'm Ray and I want, I want my brand of Ray to be represented well in the eyes of others. So that's good. And I mean, keep in mind the devil Rays didn't work because you know, that's bad Ray course but rays you, you got it you got to be consistently excellent man that's what you got to do got to be consistently excellent all the time another thing that's happening for them that's coming up rays for them is their stadium situation just as i had mentioned they have a, a crappy stadium by most baseball standards it's a bland stadium it's serviceable but it's hard to get to for residents it does not open up the florida sunshine as you would expect a stadium to do you know, expose yourself to sunshine in the form of a retractable roof. And it's in, it's hard to get to. And for some, it's in a rough neighborhood, a rough part of St. Petersburg. So despite all of those issues and the fact that current the current owner kind of inherited this situation and wants better, but wants to keep the team in the market, the city of St. Petersburg, which owns the stadium, has outright refused to have to allow it. Uh, the Tampa Bay Rays to look at other locations, be it across the nation or in Tampa or in the Tampa area, most namely Hillsborough County, where the city of Tampa is located, not St. Petersburg. I think, they, are they in Pinellas County? Is that what it is? But yeah, two separate counties and St. Petersburg doesn't want them doing business with the other one. 
They want them to stay in that stadium because they have a deal through the early 2020s and they need to live up to that deal daggummit. I'm pretty sure it's more so because St. Petersburg, despite the fact that they can't fund a renovation or that a renovation to Tropicana Field is not sound, do not want to lose their main source of income. At least I assume it's the main source of income, you know, outside of the other businesses that are there. But I feel like if you lose a major league team, you might, you know, it's studies have shown uh, before. I, let me get to this side note here. Studies have shown that having big stadiums and having pe- the taxpayers pay for it, uh, it doesn't. There's not there's really an indifferent effect that a sports team has on an area. That's what I'm trying to say. So when people say that funding that taxpayers funding a stadium will have them, it'll be paid back in form of bringing people to the city. Not there's not much shown in studies about that. But at the same time, I do think that St. Uh, St. Petersburg without the Rays. Uh, probably probably does it does have a little bit of an effect for people and their willingness to come over there to that peninsula but it seems like there's hope because there the rays and the city of st petersburg are in talks of the rays possibly looking at other locations and they'll probably be probably be looking at two different locations either in downtown tampa or at the Florida State Fairgrounds, which is where Raymond James Stadium, home of the Buccaneers, is located. So there seems to be hope there for the Rays to get a better manager and to get a better stadium. So, hey, it's not necessarily the end of the world, but at the same time, there's probably a chance of the Rays probably going through a dark period here before there's any real developments. Like, even if you get a new manager, you might still very well struggle on the field and you still have to play in a domed stadium. And while it's not the crappiest, just ask Oakland, it's still very drab and dreary, no matter how much you try to spruce it up. And so people won't come and the attendance will be bad until changes happen. But change is on the horizon. And just the glimmer of hope of change. I mean, that's got to count for something, right? So account for something, right? I'm going to change that intonation there. So, Rays fans, dry your eyes. There's hope on the other side. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. And it is in the form of talks of possibly allowing them to look at a new, uh, new stadium locations and the possibility of the crapshoot of 10 different managers. Thumbs up all the way. Coming up next, odds and ends on the other side. You're listening to The Raymond Sim Show on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network.
Back inside the Raymond Sim Show here on Spreaker.com, streaming live and soon to be on demand upon the show's completion and on demand at the Coliseum Sports Network on YouTube. If you have anything you want to talk about with me uh, that I talked about on this show, including Kobe and Dirk's milestones, uh, the Spurs still being awesome and atop the West. The Grizzlies not far behind. The Warriors needing work. Uh, college football rankings talked about that. Uh, rather not Florida State or how scared they should be of Miami. If you want to talk about uh, Derrick Rose and his comments and you want to discuss them with me after the show, you can leave a comment on the YouTube page. But it, while you're at the YouTube page, be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel there, where there's going to be much more greatness coming. It gets better, people. If you've already liked uh, what I've been doing here with the Coliseum Sports Network and with this show, just know that it gets better. You can also leave a comment uh, at Spreaker.com during, uh, you know, once this goes on demand. You can leave it now. There's just, uh, just, I got, uh, what, I got nine more minutes to go here before I have to uh, sign out. Just some odds and ends to cover, and I got a lot, just stuff rumbling around in my mind, things that I have done. Uh, Caught some action yesterday, a little bit, not a lot of it, and I didn't catch it live. I saw it on ESPN, uh, on Watch ESPN, not ESPN 3, but, you know, Watch ESPN, as it's called now. Uh, Northern Illinois and Toledo. Didn't watch the whole game, watched a part of it, but still saw some action. And what I refer to when I say action, for those who don't know, Northern Illinois and Toledo are two teams in the Mid-American Conference, with uh, you know, the Collegiate Conference, which is kind of, it's little known. It's not as big as the other big five conferences that you consider like Pac-12 and the SEC and the ACC and stuff. But it it has some fun football, and it takes place usually on off days when most football is not played. They've decided to take over Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights specifically because, you know, nothing else is happening. So, hey, why not get some national exposure? And they they do just that. So, caught some of that. Uh, I always wonder who's the new guy at Northern Illinois. I went there for a semester, so I am technically an alumni even though it's kind of a rough go there at, at, for that semester at NIU. But that's a personal thing. Still a pretty nice school. Has its good, has its bad. Uh, back when I went there, it was Chandler Harnish under center. Then eventually it became Jordan Lynch. I think there was somebody in between maybe. So I was wondering, I just wondered on a lark, hey, who, who's the new guy under center at NIU? The man's name is Drew Hare. I know nothing else about him, but uh, he has had a very good season and he has helped the uh, Northern Illinois Huskies stay atop the Mac West. So good for them. I do believe they won that game. It was a close one too. I think a touchdown separation. Maybe I will watch it. I don't know. But Maxion, catch it. Catch the fever. Uh, also of note, I happened to catch a little bit of the Japan series. I told you yesterday I had no clue what that was or how that even worked. Basically what it is is seven exhibition games of MLB All-Stars. They went over to Japan. And six of them will be against uh, an all-star team of Japanese baseball players called Samurai Japan. And so it's six games. Five of them are the official series. The final one is just an exhibition game. But their seventh game was against a team that combined two different uh, two different Japanese league teams. There's separate leagues in Japan. They're not all one league. So I don't know if they were both in the same league or if they were champions of the separate leagues. I'm not quite sure, but that was the first exhibition game. But now they're on to the series for five games before closing out with the exhibition game. Fun stuff. As I said yesterday, it was very cool to see the uh, Japanese baseball atmosphere, which is much akin to soccer or much akin to college sports like college football or college basketball. Atmosphere there is great. Kind of wish that they would carry it over here to to the U.S. If I were to go to a baseball game, like if I go to a White Sox game or a Cubs game or Brewers game like I did uh, earlier this season, then I probably would not participate. Maybe I would if I get caught up in the moment. I'm not one of those guys, but, you know, I want that for everybody else. I, I want the atmosphere to be electric. That even if I'm not standing, if I'm not screaming and losing my voice, because, you know, I need it for the show then I, I still, you know, I would hope that everybody, that somebody else is contributing. You, you go crazy, not me. I'll chill over here. But, you know, maybe if the mood's right, I might, you know, jump in too. Start doing some, oh, like they do at, you know, the, the aforementioned events like Japanese baseball and soccer and all the, all the like. 
the Choi Av thing that I was referring to, and this is the probably the first time that I have explicitly not talked about uh not talked about uh sports on this show. Choi Av is a rapper from New York. He is up and coming, you could say. Um he if whatever you think if you don't like rap and you have your stereotype, your generalization about rap I would tell you that you should not have that generalization. There's a lot of very good rap music out there. Even if you don't like it, that's fine. Just don't make generalizations. But if you hold that generalization, when it comes to Troy Ave, you're not wrong. It's it's basically, you know, the drug, gangster, hip-hop, rap that you usually, that you kind of keep in mind. Or that you kind of have it in, in, probably in your mind right now. And people who do listen to hip-hop, they know what I'm talking about. Um, he harkens back to the days of, now I'm about to go a little, little nerdy, I'm not a full-on music nerd, there's still much for me to learn, but he harkens back to the days of G-Unit and Dipset with a little more flow, and a little more even flow, so he's more like the Lloyd Banks sort of thing happening, but, uh, you know, for me, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of meh, especially considering that while New York is not the mecca of hip hop right now that it, it that it was. I mean, it still is. It's still a mecca of hip hop. It's still just not the, as big a hub as it was, especially for gangster rap. There's still a there's still a lot of up and coming New York rappers who are talking about much more conscious things. So for Troy Ave to try to bring back an old era is kind of meh. But what he did and what I noticed on my Twitter timeline is that there is an article that I haven't read yet, and usually I try to read articles before I state an opinion where he says he's the first Brooklyn rapper with heavy drug talk in his raps. I think probably even the most casual a hip-hop fan knows that that is patently false. Um, there, well, for one, considering this is 2014 and rap has been around since at least the 90s, and it was, or not the 90s, goodness, since the late 70s, and it started a borough to the north in the Bronx, so there were plenty of New Yorkers rapping. Uh, that's between then and now, there has absolutely been plenty of other Brooklyn rappers that have talked about drugs in their hip hop rhymes and stuff like that, including Notorious B.I.G. That is the biggest example that is outside of any other examples that you could fill in the gap between 2014 and the mid nineties. But Hey, that's what he said. Uh, maybe I'll check out the article, but I already discount him straight off. I've tried to listen to his music. I, I got very bored. So, if you don't like rap, now you don't like Troy Ave. I have I have converted you. And if you, you know, if you like rap, then you probably already don't like Troy Ave, unless you're his friend. But then you wouldn't be a friend if he's still rapping. Another thing I want to cover is my my the chance of me binge watching some more if you listen to the show yesterday i told you and then reported on my binge watching of all the nba highlights up to this point which by the way i need to watch the highlights from last night i only watched the highlights of the spurs and warriors gotta check out the other five so i don't fall behind might be thinking about doing the blackhawks tonight so think about that thursday will be my last general show of the week because the college basketball previews on friday so if I binge watch the Blackhawks highlights, I will tell you about them tomorrow. Have a whole show about them. It'll be awesome. And then speaking of uh, of stuff that I'm doing, it's not a good transition, not a good segue at all. But to wrap things up, my website, Sims Coliseum, I hadn't been advertising it like I should because it's not where it's supposed to be. But it's in good shape. I had repurposed a season preview for the UBC, my fictional simulation league that is posted at simscoliseum.com you can check it out you can kind of get an idea of what i'm trying to do i'm going to i'm in the process now of of getting of simulating the games i've missed and re-recording the first two broadcasts i did and then doing the other three broadcasts that i'm supposed to have done there's also supposed to, if I was on time, supposed to have been a broadcast tonight, but it won't be. I should be back on track, I'm expecting, by Monday. And so, you know, whenever I'm on track, of course, I will let you guys know and pass the savings on to you. But that's enough out of me today. I think I've, uh, I've, I've, you know, assaulted your ears enough for the past two hours. But I thank you for listening to the show, and I appreciate it very much. I thank you all 
for your continued support of the Raymond Sims Show and the Coliseum Sports Network. Uh, thank all of the followers that I have been getting here on Spreaker. You guys are awesome, and I hope that you continue to tune in. Uh, I'll, you know, like I said, it gets better. If you like it already, it's only going to get better from here. So I thank you guys. Just be sure to check me out on Twitter at Sims Coliseum, on the Facebook page and the Tumblr page, simscoliseum.tumblr.com. Also check out the website, simscoliseum.com. I'm getting more stuff put on there. So just follow along there if you're into sports fiction because I'm looking to bring it back. Like Troy Av said that he, he brought back drug rap in Brooklyn, I guess. That's a bad comparison. But thank you for listening. This has been the Raymond Sims Show on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network.